CataractCoach.com, a case of a misloaded IOL injector which causes capsule rupture. This is a video that's sent in from an anonymous surgeon. So we'll go through the beginning steps quickly. Here's creating the capsule rexus. I do want to show you that the capsule rexus is completely intact. And so we'll speed up through the beginning parts of the case. So nice, good capsule rexus. Tripan blue dye was used. Everything looks great. And uh, it's a completely round and intact rexus. The surgeon is doing a groove down the central part of the nucleus here. It looks like a stop and chop technique. And the two nuclear halves are being cracked here. Again, this is a routine case. Looks like a left-handed surgeon or an ambidextrous surgeon. So towards the end of the case, cleaning up the capsular bag, taking out all the cortex. Again, keep in mind we have an intact capsular rexus, intact posterior capsule, everything looks pretty good. Now this is a resident in training, and this is a learning case. Here's the end of the case, capsular bag being inflated with viscoelastic in preparation for the eyeball insertion. And this is where we're going to run into some issues. So here comes the lens injector. Watch carefully. The lens injector is misloaded with not enough viscoelastic. So advancing the injector. Keep watching. Look what happens. Bam. What happened there? There was not enough viscoelastic in the injector. So a lot of force had to be used to overcome the resistance of the friction. And then all of a sudden, it gave way and the lens was shot into the eye at a high velocity. And so now we're centering up the lens and the, there's a hope that everything's okay. There may be a ding or damage or crack in the central optic there. We'll see. But look at the capsular axis. Look sub-incisionally, it's gone. We don't have an intact capsular axis. And so now removing the viscoelastic at this point is going to allow vitreous prolapse. So it looks like the posterior capsule was broken during this very rapid insertion of the IOL. And the subincisional capsular axis has been damaged as well. So we no longer have an intact capsular axis. So the question here in this case is, well, what do you do? Can we leave this lens in the eye? Is there sufficient amount of support? Do I have to explant this lens? A few things we know for certain. We do not want the lens to fall back into the vitreous cavity. And we do not want to leave a single piece acrylic lens in the sulcus. That would cause a lot of chafing on the back surface of the iris. And that lens would become dislodged and cause a lot of issues. So this is removing the viscoelastic, but almost certainly also allowing vitreous to come forwards. So now the first hint here is the IOL is not centered. It's being displaced by the subincisional vitreous prolapse. So we can do an attempt to center the lens here, and that's not going to stay. I'll show you what I mean here. So coming out of the eye, there's almost certainly vitreous towards that incision at the moment. So that's going to have to be cleaned up. Cannot leave the eye like this. So in this regard, the surgeon's going to do a bimanual cleanup of the prolapse vitreous. So again, look, the, the subincisional capsule rex is gone. The posterior capsule is wide open. Those posterior striae there, that are sh that's showing you where the capsule is open. Those lines that are there in the posterior capsule. So this is certainly a case where we're going to have to do some vitreous cleanup. So coming over now, here's using a bimanual approach for vitrectomy. I like a bimanual approach. I think a bimanual approach for vitrectomy is a much better approach than doing a coaxial. And I do not recommend coaxial vitrectomy, and I do not teach that to the residents in my program. We've emphasized doing a bimanual just like this, a bimanual, smaller gauge. This appears to be about 23 gauge vitrectomy. And so you want to clean up the prolapsed vitreous here. Again, you've seen from our previous videos, using triamcinolone is helpful to stain the outer part of the prolapsed vitreous, and it makes it a lot easier to see. 
Just keep in mind that's the outer part of the vitreous that's stained, and you may have to repeat the staining. So here the surgeon is going to get that what's left of the subincisional rexus and complete that and break up, break off that piece. So now there is an ability to support this lens, but it'll probably have to be rotated about 90 degrees. So on your screen, the haptics now are vertical, 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock on your screen. We want to put them 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock or horizontal. That was a nice move. That was injecting viscoelastic underneath the Iowa optic, helpful to help support it temporarily, and also prevent vitreous prolapse. So now the lens is being rotated and positioned in uh, about 90 degrees away from the area of that subincisional capsular excess loss. So there are the haptics coming here. Now you do want to make sure you keep this still inside the capsular bag, or you want both haptics and the optic to be underneath the anterior capsular rim. So this takes a little bit of a manipulation here. Not an easy procedure. It looks like a Sinsky hook or other small um, instrument being used to place that lens appropriately. Other options here, you could just explant this lens completely and put a three-piece lens in the sulcus. And we've showed you our twist technique where you can easily implant this single-piece lens through that unenlarged temporal incision here. So now more viscoelastic being inflated inside the eye there. And the haptics now look at a more stable position. You can see the optic is underneath that capsularex's edge. And this arm as well is going to be placed there. Important to avoid placing this lens in the sulcus. If this lens is placed in the sulcus, again, it will decenter later and cause lots of other issues. So that looks like a reasonable position. And then you can see the posterior capsule has a lot of uh, lines there indicating where the capsule has ruptured. Now I'm going to have to go back inside the eye to do a little bit more removal of viscoelastic, as well as any uh, vitreous that's prolapsed. A helpful suggestion here, suture the main incision. You're done with it. Once the eye wells in the eye, we're not going to use the main incision anymore. So it's helpful to suture that main incision shut because that can leak during this bimanual vitrectomy and bimanual viscoelastic removal. And then by having just the two small paracentesis incisions, we have more stable control of the anterior chamber. So again, suturing up the incisions here at the end, very important. In a case like this with a complication, always suture. By suturing it, you're going to help prevent further issues. The last thing you want in this case is a shallow anterior chamber because with the lack of an uh, intact posterior capsule, any shallowing of the anterior chamber is also going to be accompanied by vitreous prolapse. So on the OR table, do what it takes to place the sutures to seal the incision very securely. This looks great. There's an X-shaped suture there. And you may even consider suturing the two paracentesis incisions. You don't want any leaks in the post-op period. You can see we have a nice round pupil now. That round pupil indicates that there's no vitreous being prolapsed around it. And that round pupil does overlap the optic 360. So we're fairly certain here there is no vitreous prolapsed in the anterior chamber. Lens does look well supported and in good position, so we're happy with that. So again, good suggestion here being used. Surgeon is suturing the paracentesis incisions as well. And there it is, the end of the case, and looks pretty reasonable. So this patient should do well in the post op period. Keep in mind, there will be, there'll be more inflammation and require more topical anti-inflammatories during that time. But thank you for sharing, and thank you for watching cataracoach.com.